Hello, my name is Christabel Saunders and I'm a, a breast surgeon and a researcher here in Australia in Perth. And it's my absolute pleasure today to be able to welcome Dr. Stuart McIntosh. Stuart is a breast surgeon in the UK in Belfast and he's our special guest here at the Breast Cancer Trials Meeting in Adelaide in 2019 to talk about some of the research that he's doing in the UK and we hope that he'll be bringing here to Australia. So welcome Stuart. Thank you very much Christabel, it's great to be here. Now we'd like to talk a little bit about firstly about local regional treatments for breast cancer that is treatments that are to the breast itself rather than the whole body. Where do you think there are some gaps in this research? So I think, I think there are several areas here that um, represent key gaps. The first area that we probably want to think about is around overdiagnosis and overtreatment, uh, which often occurs in association with breast screening. So overdiagnosis is the finding of cancers that would never have become apparent uh, in a woman's lifetime if she hadn't gone for her screening mammogram. Can you give me some examples of what they may be? So, yes, I mean, what we have seen over the last two or three decades since breast screening started is that there has been a huge rise in the number of cases of non-invasive breast cancer or DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, diagnosed. And what we know is that some of these cases of DCIS, as you know, may progress onto invasive disease, but it's quite possible that many of these don't progress and will possibly just sit there for years without having any clinical impact. The problem is at the moment we have no really good way of knowing which are which, and we don't really know what the best way to treat some of what we think are the lower risk um, DCIS cases. So what are some of the areas of research in this particular field? So in this field, there's a trial going on in the UK called the LORIS, the Low Risk DCIS trial, which I'm sure you've heard about, which is comparing surgery with active monitoring, so regular screening mammograms for cases of low risk DCIS, which we think are unlikely to progress. That is actually feeding into a larger global package of work called PRECISION, which stands for Prevent uh, DCIS invasive overtreatment now, and that's a large global work package led by um, Professor Jelly Veselink in the, in the Netherlands, which is trying to look at ways of di distinguishing aggressive invasive DCIS from non-invasive DCIS. So I think that's a key area of research uh, in terms of local treatment that's ongoing at the moment. All right. What other areas do you think are really important in terms of local regional treatment? So that is also the aspect we know that some some small invasive breast cancers may very well not develop as well. So we're looking at minimally invasive ways of treating those, perhaps removing them um, with, with, with biops, large, large biopsy needles rather than a formal operation to remove them. So this is a very interesting area, isn't it? Because minimally invasive surgery is obviously caught on in, in almost mm -hmm. every other field, really, yes. apart from breast surgery. Yes. So how do you see, where, where do you think we may be heading in that direction? So I think it's quite possible that we may be able to treat small, good progn prognosis uh, tumours, ones which are likely to do very well or may even not progress, by removing them with uh, under ultrasound or x-ray guidance under local anaesthetic rather than with an operation under general anaesthetic. And, and I gather you're going to be talking to us a bit at, about, about this at this meeting and you've got a trial going on, We've is that right? We've got a trial that's just setting up in the UK at the moment called the SMALL trial, which is a randomised trial looking at exactly that. It's going to compare standard surgery with minimally invasive um, treatment for so, small cancers. So does this mean the radiologists are taking over treating breast cancer? I think they may be t looking at taking over treating some of the small breast cancers that probably don't need an operation, but that's all right because that can leave us more time to focus on the things that we really need to be doing. Right. And, and what are some of the, the issues with that though? Do you, do you think there may be some problems that you foresee with that kind of treatment? I think it's, yes, it's always possible and whenever we're trialing anything, trialing anything new, I think it's important to make sure we're happy that it's safe and effective and acceptable to our patients. And I think there's always um, a need for good quality evidence to show that that, that is the case. I think that may be issues around ensuring that cancers are fully removed with this minimally invasive approach. And that's one thing that we're setting out to do in the small study is to look at how we can make sure of that and make sure that this is a safe approach um, by following our patients up. 
So it's called the small trial, but I'm mm -hmm. assuming it's probably going to be quite a big trial in it's order to be able to prove to be this. Eight, around 800 <laughs> patients, yes. Right, so is this um, something that we may be able to consider here in Australia and New Zealand? I would very much hope so, yes, I would very much hope so, and I'm looking forward to discussing that with researchers here over the next few days. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, perhaps moving into a different area, we're obviously changing our whole paradigms of how we treat breast cancer in many instances and using the treatments that we used to use afterwards, such as chemotherapy up front, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and perhaps neoadjuvant other therapies. Do you have any ideas about how that may move into the future? I have some very strong feelings about how that may move in the future because you're absolutely right, there has been a, a shift in the treatment paradigm and surgery, which was always the sort of primary treatment, is increasingly moving to being not, not always the first upfront treatment. And I think what we need to do is we need to have better ways of selecting patients for what, what is the best first treatment for them. So identifying patients who are going to need surgery first up, identifying patients who are likely to benefit maximally from, from treatment like chemotherapy or other things before surgery. I think the other key thing that we really need to do is work out, because if you look at the trial data, what we can see is that, yes, we're making lots of tumours disappear completely with pre-surgical treatment, with chemotherapy, with anti hair 2 treatments, but that doesn't actually at the moment seem to be impacting what we're doing surgically. If it doesn't seem to be lowering mastectomy rates, for example. So I think we need to have a much better understanding of how we can measure and predict the response of the tumour in the breast without doing an operation, whether that's with improved imaging techniques, whether that's with more biopsies prior to carrying out surgery, to see if we can work out which patients have had a good response, to see where we can minimise the surgery, to see if there are patients where we might even be able to avoid surgery altogether. And there are several trials, both in the UK and in Europe and the US, looking at that now. And I think the other thing that's going to be really, really important in that context is how we manage the, the, the lymph glands under the arm, the axillary lymph glands, um, as, as part of that, because conventionally they've often been removed as part of the surgical treatment after chemotherapy, for example. And I think it's, it's quite possible that we may be able to reduce the amount of surgery in that setting. So Stuart, a lot of what you've been talking about is really de-escalation mm -hmm. of treatments, yes. particularly obviously a surgeon's de-escalating mm -hmm. surgery. Mm -hmm. But you've suggested that to do that, we really need to have very accurate diagnostic tools mm -hmm. and perhaps more accurate diagnostic tools mm -hmm. than we have already. In the sphere of clinical trials, what sort of tools at the moment are you interested in us looking at? In terms of imaging or in terms of tissue diagnosis? Well, or, either, or I guess, both. Either. So I think imaging has definitely evolved over the years and we've gone from being having mammography and ultrasound to also having digital tumour synthesis to um, contrast enhanced mammography, both of which I think still need to have their places more clearly defined. And we have, obviously we have MRI scanning, which I think is a potentially very useful tool, although I think we have to bear in mind that it does have a tendency sometimes to detect subclinical disease, that's very small areas of disease which are perhaps not apparent either on examination of the patient or on standard imaging um, tests. And I think we need to more clearly outline what the significance of those is. So I think these tools are, are very valuable. I think it's also possible there may be more molecular or functional imaging coming down the line, which relies on tumour metabolic activity to, to, to image uh, tumours. And I think those potentially look very interesting, although they're not an area of expertise of mine. So really using imaging to try to map the biology yes. of the, the tumour. Yeah. Very interesting right. area. Yeah. And then I think also combining that with improved um, biopsy techniques, for example, to assess response to to chemotherapy, so where we've had a patient and we think the tumour may have responded completely, bearing in mind that not all tumours that have a complete response pathologically that actually disappear, they don't all have a complete response radiologically, so you can still see something, we need to be able to biopsy that, whether that's with standard core biopsy as we've used for a long time, or increasingly perhaps vacuum assisted or other biopsy types to try and allow us to determine how well a tumour has actually responded to treatment. So really, we're also moving into the, area, into the area where we as surgeons can help with, for example, window studies, where uh, we can look at the, the response short term with short term outcomes to, to treatments. So I think window studies are a really valuable 
uh, opportunity and I think surgeons are integral to the success of window studies. So window study is where you perhaps give 14 days of treatment between the, the, in the interval between diagnosis and having an operation, which is a natural interval that ge generally tends to happen while a patient's waiting to have their surgery. And that allows us really to use serial biopsies at diagnosis and after treatment to assess the biological activity of, of whatever drug it is that you're interested in. And I think that actually provides us with a very valuable opportunity to assess new agents. It used to be the case that a lot of new agents would come into play in patients who had advanced disease and then we gradually work back from there once we'd shown they had activity. Actually, I think the window of opportunity setting is a much more useful opportunity to, to show activity for a new drug. And I think it's, it's a very exciting uh, place to be. And you really do need surgeons to, have, to, be, to be involved in those studies because if you don't, they, they don't work, you can't do them. No, absolutely. So finally, Stuart, perhaps I could ask you uh, some of the clinical trials that y you know are going on and particularly those you're involved with in the UK. Could you just talk us through a few of those that may be very applicable here in Australia and New Zealand and that we may be able to get involved with? So obviously you've got a great track record of being involved in trials like that with your involvement in the POSNOC trial, which is looking at whether or not further surgery is necessary after a sentinel node biopsy. I've already mentioned uh, the small trial, which is looking at minimally invasive approaches, and I very much hope that's something that we can work together on. We also have several other de-escalation studies in setup at the moment, so there is a trial together on. It's being uh, developed by Amit Goyle, who runs POSNOC. That's going to be looking at de-escalating axillary surgery after neoadjuvant chemotherapy and that's currently we're just waiting to hear about a funding decision for that so that's something that again that might be possible to explore with Amit. Other studies we have running we have the prime time study which is a radiotherapy de-escalation study which is looking at women who have over 60 with ultra low risk breast cancers and looking at emitting radiotherapy in those patients and what we have discussed doing in future, hopefully, is combining the results of small and prime time to see whether there are patients that we may be able to manage with minimally invasive surgery and no radiotherapy. So that's the direction of travel um, there. So we have prime time. We also have the NOSTRA trial, which is the no surgery after neoadjuvant chemotherapy study. We're currently in the feasibility phase of that, which is looking at the ability of imaging and biopsy to predict response to neoadjuvant treatment, and all patients in the feasibility phase will have surgery. But if that feasibility phase works and demonstrates that this is a, a viable technique, we look to move on to the actual no surgery randomised trial. I think one of the keys, particularly of de-escalation treatments, is really getting our patients, consumers on board. And I think that's something we probably do quite well in our breast cancer trials group, as mm -hmm. well as elsewhere yes. in Australia and New Zealand. Tell me how you've managed to do that in the UK, because that's vital, isn't it, it, it to is making these, these trials vital work? Absolutely vital to making them work and making them successful and, and getting them funded as well, because you have to demonstrate that you have something which is important to patients and acceptable to patients and is going to confer a clear benefit for them. So we're very lucky in the UK, we have the, the NCRI, the National Cancer Research Institute, actually has a consumer forum, which allows us to uh, obtain patient uh, expertise for studies and similarly we have the Independent Cancer Patient Voice group who are a group of um, cancer patients who are, well as the name suggests they're independent, they're not affiliated to any of the national organisations and again they are very happy to become involved with um, studies. I think it's really key to get patients involved at as early a stage as possible and I'm very lucky with small that I've had two ICPV members who've been integral to the development of the, the study. And so actually developing the trial, actually developing not just the taking trial. part. It's not just taking part, it's right from the very beginning. The idea was floated and we said to them, do you think this is an acceptable idea? And one of our patient members, um, Maggie Wilcox, was on the UK independent breast screening review so she had good insight into the problems around over diagnosis and over treatment and it was very useful to have her input into whether the idea was acceptable, how we should define our endpoints, what were actually the important things to patients and I think that's if your research is going to be worthwhile and patient focused and ultimately confer the patient benefit that we want to see then that's what you need.
Well, thank you, Stuart, and thank you once again for coming to our breast cancer trials meeting here in Australia. I know your input's going to be so valuable over the next few days, and also your input through this uh, video is going to be valuable to a much wider audience in Australia and New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here.